So let's look at, first of all, so everybody was pretty much correct that your standard MRI and your standard CT isn't really going to show you much of anything. That's the hallmark of the mild TBI is that there is no big blood injury, there is no big lesion that you're really gonna see. Now diffusion tensor imaging actually does have the ability to show you some of that fine shearing damage. So DTI is really interesting and you might be able to see an MTBI on that. You're not going to get diffusion tensor, diffusion tensor imaging for very many of your patients. That's still really in the research phase. Also, something that's very, very cool, high definition fiber tracking. I just read about this. One, I just wanted everybody to see that amazingly gorgeous picture. Right? There's one of these in the country. If you look at this, the Discover uh, link at the bottom, there's a whole article about the person that developed this and they're still proving it, proving the concept that these images are actually legit. But here you can see that telephone cable is broken in multiple places. So we might actually be able to start seeing this in the future. So number two is not the right answer. Now number four, no biomarkers? No, that's not true. So SNTF, which is a blood biomarker, is correlated with cognitive impairment three months post-injury. So if it's elevated in the blood, then you might see that cognitive impairment. If it's not elevated, the patient might be okay. So anxiety following TBI, that is the most frequently diagnosed disorder following any kind of TBI. Up to 70% of individuals are coming up with an anxiety disorder post-TBI, 14% developing panic. Mind you, MTBI places patients at risk for all psychiatric disorders more than the general population. But anxiety is kind of at the top of the list. More likely with the mild TBI than the moderate or severe, which is interesting. Cognitive deficits is the most common complaint following TBI. They tend to persist for decades. They may include maintaining attention, inhibiting correct responses, recognizing mistakes. And the attentional deficits with the history of concussion are very similar to the MCI and Alzheimer's disease. And this is a much, much, much longer conversation, but we all know the story with concussions and people showing up with dementia and the whole thing that the NFL's been going through. So it's kind of interesting that that's fairly consistent with that. Conventional antipsychotics being first line, you want to avoid things that are sedating for starters. So the patient is already impaired, they're already having cognitive problems, so anticholinergics and sedatings are probably not the way to go. You want to avoid agents that might place them at risk for seizure because they're already at risk. Avoid the conventionals. Some animal data has indicated that maybe they don't recover as well on conventionals, and patients with TBI might be more prone to side effects. I've definitely found that in my practice. And that's why you also start low and titrate slow. I'm usually kind of a double barrel shotgun sort of guy when it comes to medications. This is the one population that I tend to be very, very light touch because I have found that they can be very, very sensitive to even low doses of medications. So conventional is not your first choice here. Now, early initiation of N-acetylcysteine. Interesting, interesting. So placebo actually did not have the effect that you think it has when you looked on here. Right? I've been known to say that placebo is a wonderful drug. It's just I couldn't tolerate the side effects. You know, <laughs> Works so great, but it made me so sick. But this placebo arm that you see here is actually treatment as usual. So placebo plus all the normal therapies and reduced activity and management of symptoms versus that stuff with N-acetylcysteine. Early treatment means first 24 hours. So the late treatment arm that doesn't recover nearly as well is actually 26 hours plus. So that NAC has to come within that first day after an injury. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tempted to just start taking NAC for the next time, I mean, seriously, I'm clumsy. You guys didn't know that about me. So, neuropathology of the MTBI, this is a big thing, but we get the stretching and the shearing. Remember when you have a concussion, your brain is bouncing around back and forth and smacking against both sides of your head. You can have neuroinflammation, ion flux, ionic disequilibrium, excitatory neurotransmitters, right? Too much and it kills the cells, excitotoxicity, impaired glucose metabolism and <gasps> cell death. NAC may interfere with that. So NAC has the possibility of being neuroprotective. And it's a simple thing, it's well tolerated. So it might be a very good thing to bring that in very early in the course. So the first answer is the correct one, early initiation of NAC. The other answers are wrong. Don't pick them. <laughs>